Welcome back to another edition of TI Now. We're joined with MJ Petroni. He's a cyborg anthropologist and he's here uh, leading our TIA advisory group meeting. And MJ, welcome to the program. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Uh, of course, I have to ask you, what is a cyborg anthropologist? Well, cyborg anthropology was a field started in the mid 80s by a Dr. Donna Haraway. And basically what it does is study the relationship between humans and technology. So not just how are we making new technologies, but how are they changing us culturally and individually? Now, the very, at the very beginning of your presentation uh, this morning for TIA's advisory group meeting, um, you put up on a slide uh, the social network of things. Explain that to us and explain the contrast between that and the Internet of Things. Well, the Internet of Things is a discussion and, and whole trend that's going on in the tech industry right now. Um, there's two big things to note about it. For the most part, the average individual isn't touched by it that much yet. And secondly, the Internet of Things is taking analog ideas and analog or simple devices at least and making them a little more connected. So for example, uh, smart meters tell us a little bit more about our energy consumption in a more convenient way. But basically they're doing what we used to do a little bit better than we used to do it. Faster, you know, in a more measurable way perhaps. The social network of things is a whole other paradigm. Um, it's an evolution of the Internet of Things, and it's where the leading edge of Internet of Things is headed. And the distinction between the two is that the Internet of Things is about this past-based information, and the social network of things does this piece of connecting multiple devices together and also telling us a bit about what might come in the future. A really great example is like driverless cars that can actually negotiate with each other to avoid an accident. That requires a whole framework of interoperability, new communications networks, and you know, legal frameworks and cultural understanding that isn't present in the Internet of Things discussion yet. It seemed like a big part of your presentation today was taking us from where we are now to where we need to be and really even 20 to 30 years out into the future. As far as the social network of things and the Internet of Things, can you take us really quickly from industrial M2M all the way to the cyborg age? So, you know, when actually what we talk about is more around the industrial age moving into the information age and then beyond that to a uh, cyborg age. So what I mean by that is, you know, the industrial age was about making things. And where we are right now is the, you know, actually still more of the beginnings of the information age than we perhaps realize. Right now we have a lot of data, but it's not meaningful information yet. We've only just barely scratched the surface of, what possible, of what's possible by you know, analyzing our existing data. And as we add more and more sensors and connected devices, the quality of our insight and the value that provides to people is going to go much, much higher. So we haven't even reached the apex of the information age. And the cyborg age is a whole other level. That's where the human and machine technology merges at a level that has been unprecedented in human history, where the line between human bodies and machine you know, augmentation is not going to be as obvious as it used to be. Our very first signs of this are things like you know, uh, optical implants or you know, auditory implants, um, even now some brain implants and, and hearts, you know, pacemakers, that kind of thing. But as we go further, we'll see this dynamic of wetware, the, the installation of implants or devices in our bodies to augment our capabilities become bigger and bigger. There's even people who are almost kind of like hobbyists or body modifiers who are implanting little magnets in their hands so they can feel electromagnetic fields. That's just the very basic beginnings of this age. Another one of these transitions that you talked about, uh, part, in part anyway, in your presentation uh, throughout today's advisory group meeting at TIA was the transition from IT as we know it to informatics. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So, you know, it used to be that we had, you know, companies that made products, physical things, and then we had maybe software companies that did something around data and information. But right now, what we're seeing is that, uh, as David Kirkpatrick, the founder of the Techonomy Conference says, every company is now a software company. So what that means for us is that automakers aren't just car makers anymore, they're mobility providers. They have an entire platform around the data and thus the information that they glean from that data that requires a much broader set of capabilities. So if IT was originally invented in some ways to help us you know, grease the skids and make things easier for analog products, adding a little bit of a digital layer. A fully digital business requires the strategic capability of all key members of the business and the people that support it strategically outside of the organization to understand the impact of their decisions on information design, data design, hardware, software, all of it. And the truly digital businesses out there, the Netflixes and Googles of the world, are, um, you know, have taught us quite a bit about what we need to do in more traditional companies. Staying on uh, this transition, um note 
Uh, you said also in your presentation you were talking about brands and how they will move from push to pull. What did you mean by that? My colleague Mark Bonchek um, has come up with this acronym called Ongoing Relationships Beyond Individual Transactions, or ORBIT for short. And what it means is that we need to get into conversation with the people that we're trying to serve, not just to relate to them as consumers that we push things out to, but as co-creators who can actually provide us value as well. So he, I think if I quote him correctly, he said, if you want to build loyalty, stop using your data to sell things to people and start using your data to provide value to people, insight around their own behavior. So in other words, help people learn about themselves and use that in order to you know, develop true and meaningful relationships with, the, with your end customers. Now, uh, going back again to the presentation today, you asked about um, some of the topical, top of mind, uh, hot topics, if, if you will, uh, on the minds of the uh, participants uh, during that meeting, and everyone gave their suggestions. You had sheets and sheets and sheets of them. And there were also tensions in the industry that were listed, but not as many. What were some of those tensions? Well, you know, some of the tensions in the industry, as opposed to tensions in kind of these advances in the age of, you know, the information age as we go towards more of this cyborg age, they're a little bit different. But the near-term tensions we're seeing within the industry are things like, you know, how do we develop new standards for 5G? Or how do we balance the need for network stability and consistency with the need for open innovation? So there's a lot of debate right now, both inside and outside the industry, about what the role of telecoms and broadband service providers and this entire industry should be in the larger context of a full spectrum of innovation throughout our country and our world. In a nutshell, um, MJ, if you don't mind, can you, can you give us your assessment of what the industry will look like in 10 years and what it will look like in 30? The industry's lines in all industries across the, mark, you know, across the entire business world, the line between industries is going to blur and the line between the idea of businesses and quote unquote consumers will, will blur as well. Because what a digital business does is constantly listen to its customers and let them provide input and guidance on products or services that are being offered. And that also, um, you know, they do that with strategic partners as well. So it used to be you would go to a vendor for just one thing. Now you go to a partner to build platforms together, whole big digital businesses. What that means for the industry is that you know, telecom might move into financial services like it's doing in other parts of the world. Um, you, know, you might see deep integrations between telehealth systems or e-health and the telecoms that you know, provide that infrastructure and pipes, the foundation for these digital products. But you'll also see it where you know, um, end customers are choosing a lot more granular details around their service as data connections become not just a nice to have, but something that's absolutely essential even you know, for personal things that aren't just in the realm of what they do when they sit down at work. MJ, I know that TIA appreciates your thought leadership for today's advisory group meeting leading up to TIA 2015. That, of course, will be in early June of next year. And I just heard that you will be keynoting at that uh, event as well. Is that right? Yeah, so we'll be, we'll be talking about the social network of things and other key trends affecting the industry, but also the world at large. I mean, I think a big thing that's necessary for leaders in this you know, coming generation of business is understanding the broader social implications of what they're doing. As our resources go down, you know, and we need to be more careful about our allocation of, of natural resources, and as the cost for doing business rises, we must be very, very you know, conscientious and wise about the relationship we have with the end customers and each other. And so we need to look at a broader perspective than just what affects our industry in the next few months, but instead at what really is happening in the next 10, 20, even 100 years. Well, we're looking forward to the conference next year. Great. Thank you so much Thanks, for inviting Andy. me. Thank you.